Okay, so I'm dying to know. What is, if anything, the most common misconception that the people who come to you have about what it's going to be like to live and work abroad? Just not realizing how really long it takes to get settled into a new place or into a new type of lifestyle. And I have to remind myself of that even after all of these moves, because it's always like, I want it to be, you know, I've done this so many times now, shouldn't it go faster? But actually the reality is it doesn't go any faster. Are you ready? All right. Welcome to the Remote Work and Travel Show. I'm your host, Nora Dunn, aka The Professional Hobo. And in this series, I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary travel lifestyles and remote careers to get the real dirt on what it's really like to travel long-term while working remotely. Now, I will say that today's guest is actually a bit of a departure from this theme in that initially when he started his travel lifestyle, he wasn't working remotely. And I'm really looking forward to digging into what it was like to get jobs in various countries on the ground. But before I introduce my guest, I do want to encourage you, if you haven't already downloaded your free checklist of 10 things to do before you travel long term, I highly recommend you check it out. The link will be in the show notes or the description, and it'll definitely set you up to travel long term way better than I did when I started. Now, my guest today is David McNeil. As the founder of Expat Empire, David McNeil is inspiring people to move abroad and he's helping them do it. He's originally from the United States, and he's been living abroad permanently since 2014, and he's traveled to nearly 60 countries so far. David's passion for living abroad was cultivated through his studies of the Japanese language that started at age 12. He studied finance and Japanese at university, and on graduating, he began his career in investment banking, and then he transitioned into software product management in the San Francisco Bay Area. During his first product management role, he was offered the opportunity to work at the company's Beijing office for three months, which reignited his desire to live abroad for the long term. Six months after returning from China, he received a job offer in Tokyo and finally achieved his dream of living in Japan. After spending two years in Tokyo, David lived in Berlin for three years, and he's been living in Porto, Portugal since 2019. So we started Expat Empire in 2018 to empower more people to experience the joys of living abroad. Expat Empire offers content such as courses, books, podcasts, blog posts, and events, as well as personalized consulting services to support people in taking their next steps abroad. David, what a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And where am I catching you right now? Are you in Porto? I am. I'm in downtown Porto, where I've been since November 2019, so about two and a half years. Wow, sweet. Okay, well... There's so many things that I want to dig into you, uh, with you, but I, I'm going to start with uh, the first thing that is pressing on my mind, which is you have worked abroad in a variety of different countries and you got those jobs locally and you worked. So what countries have you worked in and what were you doing for those companies? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess as far as my work experience, like you mentioned at the beginning, uh, I did have an opportunity to work for three months in Beijing, China as a software product manager, I guess that's the main sort of way I would describe the work that I was doing. So product management. And at that company, I was working on mobile games. So the games you play on your phone. Um, That's the way it started for me. And then I continued to do product management and marketing roles in Japan. Uh, So I worked at a uh, sportswear company there for two years. That was a, a new job that I got in Japan. So the only time that I went with the same company I was already working for was that three months in China. And so basically, uh, to give the context there, I came back from that experience and long story short, I got laid off two months later with a couple other folks in the product management department. And so I was no longer headed back to China. It was uh, now trying to figure out what was next. And ultimately, uh, yeah, about six months later, I got my job offer in Japan. And then as I was thinking about where it was next, uh, I was always having Berlin, Germany in the back of my mind. So I went there, got a job uh, again as a product manager, senior product manager that time. Uh, worked at a couple different companies in Germany, and then also thought about what was next again and really was attracted to coming here to Portugal. So I got a job as a senior product manager at a company, uh, actually a German company that was having an office, a, a subsidiary in Matosinhos, which is a nearby town to Porto. So I was working there initially before refocusing on Expat Empire full time. So each of those moves and then to Germ- Germany and then to Portugal were all brand new companies that I hadn't worked for prior to the move. So in each of those cases, then you chose the country, you knew where you wanted to go, and you found a job there. 
how did you do that? How did you find jobs from uh, afar and navigate things like the visa process and language barriers and, and all the things that might prevent people from getting jobs abroad themselves? I can honestly say it was not an easy process, so I would not want to sort of sugarcoat it too much and make it look like it was just, hey, dropped a couple applications and there I got the job offer. But I think what happened for me was quite fortunate that, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I was working in software product management in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I think having that core of experience that I gained in the United States and before that, a couple of years in investment banking um, really gave me something on my resume that was quite different from what they would find in local talent. And especially working in tech companies and having you know positions at startups and things of that nature, it was great to be able to leverage those experiences for global products that were based uh, companies based in other countries and to work in English as well. So in the case of Japan, I did speak Japanese, but even in that case, I in the interview process didn't even get interviewed in Japanese. It was a very you know unique role, I'd have to say, on a global team um, based in Tokyo. So. Uh, people from all over the world were on this small team um, that we had this kind of special office there in Shibuya in downtown Tokyo. So even that was a unique case. But of course, after that, I didn't speak German when I went to Germany. I didn't speak Portuguese coming to Portugal. So it was really trying to leverage those experiences that I'd already developed in the United States and then subsequent jobs in Japan, for example, to get to Germany where I could leverage those skills and, and work in an English speaking environment. So um, in terms of the process, every country was a bit different, but really I would say the main areas where I tried to find work were um, the you know job boards, of course, reaching out to my network, alumni at the university, people I studied Japanese with, for example, um, talking to headhunters and recruiters, uh, re- you know, just doing direct applications if I could. But you know, every country is different in terms of the way that they do their application processes, how important it is to have relationships, what type of experience that you need. So. Uh, I certainly feel like I was fortunate, but it also was a long and quite elaborate process from start to finish. How do you even find English speaking companies that are hiring in countries that aren't English speaking countries? I mean, I did right there. I'm already kind of stopped and, and befuddled at this process. Were there websites that you used or certain techniques that you used in doing your research? I think as probably most people coming from countries like the United States, for example, would start on LinkedIn. It doesn't mean that that's going to be the best place to find jobs in that country, but I think it's a decent place to look and see if they engage with that product, if they put their uh, job descriptions there. And to look more closely, in particular, at the job descriptions and seeing what language that they're written in. I think that's a key thing to sort of say, is this company potentially open to people from international backgrounds? Naturally, in the description, if it's in English, that's a good sign. Uh, But if it also says must be native uh, fluent and native level fluent in some other language, then, you know, that might make things more difficult. Uh, But if you're if it's bonus points for speaking another language or something like that, then I think it's pretty good to go ahead and send your application in. But um, that's probably where I'd start with the process and trying to find those jobs. But again, each country is different. And if you have anyone that you know in the country, or if you can reach out to headhunters and recruiters to get feedback on that, or even people that you find, for example, on LinkedIn that are in similar roles that are from similar backgrounds to yourself, then I think it's worth trying to reach out and really try to network because that can go a long way. Um, that's that's how I found some of my positions, some of them uh, through referrals and my network, some of them through recruiters, some from direct applications. So I guess I've kind of seen it a bit from all directions and I think it's all possible. It just uh, takes a bit of, of luck and definitely a lot of hard work. Now you've been working or you were working in software product management, which sounds like a very tech a central job in the companies that you worked for, were there a variety of positions or were they really just tech jobs? And the reason I'm asking this is if someone isn't versed in software product management or a skill like that, are there still opportunities for them to find jobs in companies abroad? I think there are still opportunities, but it certainly makes it easier if you're able to try to find a way that you can work for, let's say, a more contemporary and more modern, recent, new company. It doesn't have to be uh, a, a you know series A pre-seed startup. In fact, that's probably more difficult to get your foot in the door. But if it's if it's a larger technology company, if it's growing, if they have new opportunities, if they're trying to tackle uh, and, and grow into new markets and conquer, whether that's you know the U.S. or other even just other markets that speak different languages, even in Europe, for example, I think it's good to probably focus on those more than um, than some of the larger, older, more traditional conglomerates, uh, multinational companies. 
even if what I, you know what I saw in Japan, for example, was you'd think if it's a San Francisco based company, but a very large tech company, for example, well, they must need people that you know have my experience and background, even if I don't speak Japanese. But what I found in a lot of those companies was that it was actually the local office, uh, even if it was a huge one there in Tokyo or whatever part of Japan would be full of Japanese speaking Japanese people, you know? And so just because it might have that uh, foreign brand name and, and base doesn't necessarily mean that on the ground there will be opportunities there. So I would just try to reach out to those companies that might be more forward thinking and, and international in their mindset. But in terms of the types of roles, naturally, if you can do something that might be more you know, useful to companies in that space, that would be great. Um, and, and maybe you could build those skill sets if you don't have them already. But on top of that, I would also say it doesn't have to be a technical skill set. They need marketers, they need salespeople, they need customer support. Um, you know, there's all different types of roles that you can try to get into these companies. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that is really hands-on, uh, technical in nature. I, I personally don't have you know, a programming background, a technical background. So I was lucky to get into the roles that I did. Um, but despite that, uh, I knew many people that were doing more customer support roles, content writing, um, sales and marketing and so forth. So I still think there's definitely possibilities there if you don't have the skills already just to add them to your resume and then try to use it from that standpoint. Now, my understanding is that in order to get a working visa in another country, more often than not, there has to be a lot of there's a lot of boxes that got to get that have to get checked. Uh, and I'm going to ask you about that. But my own understanding also is that one of those boxes that often needs to get checked is the uh, the sponsoring company or the, the immigration needs to you need to be able to prove that the job that you do is not something that someone who already lives and works and is a citizen of the country could do. So I'm going to assume that the companies that you got these jobs with helped you get your visas. Uh, what was that process like? And what would you say to the idea, like to someone who maybe doesn't have a really specialized skill, but does want to work abroad? How would you advise them? Yeah, it is important to be able to show that you have a unique and differentiated skill set. And as I mentioned, even having that starting from the United States and building that a little bit, I was only a few years into my career. So it's not like I already had a decade of experience. Um, so even a little bit can go a long way. Uh, so that might just be something to think about for people that are coming out of university or high school now is trying to get that experience first before trying to make the move. But if folks don't have maybe some of those uh, skills that are in particularly high demand, I would also say, um, and, and what I mean in high demand is in terms of some sort of, yeah, maybe tech and growing industries and things of that nature. But if you do have skills that are on a skill shortage list, list for example, that can be a way that you can get a skills shortage visa. And that can be a good way to try to enter the country as well, which might be, you know, areas uh, like chefs or doctors or all different types of fields. Of course, this is always changing and depends country by country, even if they offer that type of visa. But just to give an idea of how you might be able to approach it in a way that isn't so strictly, you know, the work, the standard work visa or the highly skilled working visa, depending on what skills that you have. And you know what, that's a great point that you make. I remember having a, a friend back in Canada who decided that she wanted to move to Australia. And uh, so she chose the country as you did. And then what she did was she specifically went to their immigration website and looked up their skills shortages. And one of them was was tailoring, I believe. And she did not know how to sew at the time, but uh, she went out and got the skills to be able to satisfy that. And then that paved her way to be able to move to Australia. Now, in each of the cases that you got these working visas in uh, in Japan, Germany, and Portugal, was it the companies that sponsored you? Were they helpful for you in that process? And what would you recommend regarding the visa process for someone who's unfamiliar with what it's like to get a working visa abroad? Yeah, that's a good question. And it was a huge help that the companies did, of course, help me with that process, at least in terms of giving me the core documentation. And, you know, naturally, it's in their best interest for me to be able to get the visa and to be able to live and work there legally. So that they were definitely incentivized to help. And I think it is a good approach if you want to get abroad long term and maybe from a perspective of also trying to live in a certain country for a longer time than a tourist visa might allow to go and try to find these jobs, because you can also potentially get help from a relocation point of view in terms of a relocation package or a lump sum. Um, there's just, it, it kind of rolls out the red carpet a little bit. And I don't mean that in the way of, obviously, if you're a super senior executive and you worked at the company for 20 years and now they're giving you the opportunity to run the, the Malaysian office or whatever it is, that's awesome. But I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about even a few thousand dollars, even 
uh, help from the standpoint of, you know, yeah, getting your visa. But what I'd also say is that there were plenty, there were times in there as well where they didn't really help me that much in terms of getting settled or, or getting my visa. It was basically, hey, we'll give you, you know, a thousand or a couple thousand bucks to move over here. Not that much, but this is a lump sum of which they take taxes as well. And then uh, you, you're kind of on your own. So what I would say for people who are in those situations, which are becoming more and more common for international relocations, is to spend the money, to invest the money in getting someone to help you to manage the uh, and navigate the immigration process. Because it is difficult in the first place, if not you know completely inscrutable for somebody from the outside. But even more so if you are working for a company and usually what they'll do is they'll bring you uh, to, you know, they'll, they'll help you get to the country or they'll say, you know, buy your ticket or whatever. But as soon as you get there, maybe a day or a week later, you already have to start this new job and you have to prove yourself and you have you know so much to learn people to meet, at least in the roles that I had. I knew that I was like straight off, you know, to hit the ground running right after entering these countries. And so if you have to do that and figure out your visa and figure out your housing and, you know, do your utilities and make friends and, you know, get, you know, get over the jet lag, all of this stuff at the beginning, it's, it's a ton to take on. So what I've learned over the process is that it's worth hiring help. And uh, even in my last assignment, uh, you know, coming here to Portugal, it was a question of, did, did we want, we, we, would, we would have had to spend our, you know, lump sum or our money on uh, an immigration lawyer. And it was basically a no brainer. <clears throat> they recommended somebody and we just said, yep, that sounds great. So um, that's what I've learned. And I think a lot of people learn the hard way. So uh, for what it's worth, that would be my general recommendation. And hopefully people will follow. I, now I'm, I'm curious, this, when I was doing some research about uh, you and your background, uh, one of the things that I discovered is that you worked six jobs over the course of seven years. You were laid off from three, you quit three. So I'm assuming that life happened while you were busy making plans to live and work in those countries. What happened in those cases and to what extent did that disrupt whatever plan you had in place or whatever ideas you had in place for living abroad? Wow, that's a really good question and a good way to put it because it definitely there were a lot of disruptions along the way. I mean, each one of those was different, but I, you know, what I would say in general is absolutely that's the case. So I went through six jobs in seven years. I'm not proud of that fact. That of course isn't what I went out to try to accomplish, but that is the reality of how it went. And I think it's very good to share this information because this is this can happen to other people as well. Like just because you found a job in another country. Doesn't mean you're going to like the job. Doesn't mean it's going to last forever. Doesn't mean that you know you're not going to get cut up, caught up in budget cuts, uh, or you know dislike your boss or your team, or you know want to go and see greener pastures elsewhere. And I also realized, well, I, I kind of knew this even before starting this international journey. But just because you're you you're able to live in another country, just because you have a job there that sponsors your visa, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be happy. Like what I mean is. Just being in the country wasn't enough for me. I also wanted to, it depends on the person, of course, but for me, I wanted to progress in my career as well. So it was really important to be doing something that I want to do with people that I want to do it with. And uh, that's kind of where those quitting different companies came up as well. So uh, it definitely disrupted things a lot. Um, of course, when I quit, then usually I knew what was coming next because I tend to be a more risk adverse person and trying to figure out what, where I would go to next. But of course, with the layoffs, that was challenging. But it also gave me an e kind of each of those times that it happened a chance to reassess and figure out what was next. Like I mentioned, getting laid off from the company in San Francisco coming fr back from Beijing. Long story short, that gave me the opportunity to go out and apply to companies in China and Japan and ultimately get that job in Japan, which was my big you know, life goal, I would say. Um, so to get that out of the way in terms of achieving that at 26 years old was pretty amazing. Um, and then similarly, more recently, getting laid off here in Portugal with budget cuts coming from COVID, it was just a chance to finally, you know, jump two feet in uh, on Expat Empire, which I'd started a couple of years before, but it was really that chance to reassess. And pretty much the next week after I got that news, I was straight off to figuring out how to register here in Portugal and get everything going and just making it my full-time focus. And we're definitely going to dig into Expat Empire. I'm really curious uh, about the program, how, why you developed it and whatnot. But I'm curious. So Japan, 
right? At the age of 12, you started studying Japanese, you developed this dream to live in Japan. At 26, you realize this dream, you got the job in Tokyo, you moved to Japan. In my experience, of course, our expectations of what a place is going to be like is often very different from the reality of what it's like to live and work there. Um, and I, I know you're very much in love with Japanese culture. I spent a few months in Japan and, and found I had there was a lot of things that I had not expected about the culture uh, that I found to be like really quite arresting in, in certain ways. Uh, there are certain aspects of Japanese culture that I absolutely fell in love with and others that I thought, oh, I could never live and work here. Um, so I'm curious curious what you're after a lifetime of really uh, loving and researching and immersing yourself from afar in Japanese culture. What was it like to move there and live there and work there? That is uh, a wonderful question because there's just so much, <laughs> there's so much I could say about that. And I'm sure I could talk about it for the next hour, but I would say first and foremost, it was incredible. I mean, that was my that was my big dream. I um, went to Japan the first time when I was 17. I went a second time when I was 19. And after that trip at 19, I told myself, you know what? I love this country. This is great. I'm going to keep studying Japanese, keep trying to get here. But I don't want to come back unless I'm living here. Like I was tired of just being a tourist. I felt like I had, it, it was a one month trip each time. So I kind of felt like I had seen a lot. I'd gone, I'd gone to a lot of cities and I just didn't want to, you know, have the experience of going there and having to come back home to somewhere else. I wanted Japan to be home. So for me to finally achieve that was incredible. Uh, that said, I also recognized well before I had the opportunity to finally move there. And even as I was searching for internships, even as I was trying all these different routes to try to get there in the years leading up to finally getting the job offer, that it might not be the final you know, place for me. It might not be the perfect place for me because uh, just some of the challenges around the work culture and the hierarchy and, and you know, being uh, non-Japanese, living in Japan and all of this. I knew going in that it might not be uh, ideal or, or exactly what I wanted, but I think my approach to all of these things just tends to be eventually, I'm tired of playing the what if game of what if I like it, what if I don't like it, what if the job is bad, what if I get fired, what if I get, you know, what if I want to quit, what if I need to do this or that. It's really like I want to experience it for myself. And if I love it, great. If I don't love it, that's fine. And then I know. The thing is to know because you've actually done it. So for me, that was kind of how I approached it. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why did you leave after two years? And it's a great question. That's not what I had intended. I, I thought, well, maybe, you know, I'll be in Japan for the next decade or five decades or whatever. Uh, but what basically happened is, I, in short, I found that my job was changing and not really what I wanted to do. Um, my opportunity at that company was to move to the Boston office, which was a company, a different company that they had recently acquired that was doing the same type of thing, or staying potentially in Japan, but doing something totally different at the company. I didn't join the company because of the sportswear or what they were doing. I joined because I had a chance to work in Japan as a product manager. And so I didn't want to move back to the U.S., I didn't want to stay there and do something else. So I did apply to a ton of other companies there, about 50 companies, and I did not get an offer. And that's the, the, that's the true reality of the situation. Again, I'm just trying to be uh, transparent in my experience and, and what, you know, what I went through. Um, and I got close many times, even with the top level proficiency in Japanese of the, the JLPT, the exam that they have there. I didn't make it. And, um, you know, some of those I didn't really feel good about and I didn't really pursue to the end and some of them they just pick somebody else but so be it you know that led me eventually to berlin uh, where i met my wife and you know got my started my european experience so it's all been good from that perspective but um i did find that some of the cultural elements were more difficult than i so well not necessarily than i anticipated but they were as difficult maybe as i anticipated and and, and certainly uh, more challenging in ways that i didn't expect I love Japan. What I would say is I love the lifestyle. If I didn't have to worry about working, if I was just retired there, that would be a pretty sweet place to live. But I think actually being involved in working in Japan, especially for Japanese companies, is probably not perfectly matched with my sort of personality and, and my hopes and dreams. And so, you know, maybe if I can continue working for myself there, that would be great or potentially retiring there in the future. But uh, it was a, it was a great learning experience for sure. And I really like the fact that you said it, you know, it may not have worked out the way you had thought it would, but it did leave you, lead you to Berlin, Berlin, where you did meet your wife, who ironically is Japanese. We're, we're going to talk about yes. that in a second. <laughs> 
Um, but I'm, I'm curious now in terms of, I mean, I think that, that your breadth of experience is fabulous because of course I've always been in love with my dream was long-term culturally immersive travel and the way to stay somewhere and really immerse in the culture. Uh, one of the best ways to do that, of course, is to live and work in that country. Uh, and you can learn so much about the nuances of a culture and a country this way. So what were, I mean, you went from Japan to Germany, so, and Tokyo to Berlin. What were some of the differences that you found in the living and working environments in each of those places? I would say uh, it was much bigger culture shock than I expected. Um, <laughs> I remember my dad asking me, because he had, he had studied German for a while and he had been to Germany a few times. I hadn't been much, but basically I took this trip. Uh, in short, I took a long trip, um, about two months across Europe in between the time I got laid off from the job in, in uh, San Francisco and ultimately at the end of that trip had managed to get the final interview and ultimately the offer for that job in Japan. So uh, during that time I visited Berlin, I thought it was awesome. You know, I was only there for a couple of days, but I really felt like this is an amazing city. There's so much to see and I want to get underneath the surface. I don't want to just have a tourist experience. I want to live and, and breathe and, you know, try to just get underneath it. And, um, and so that was always in the back of my mind, uh, but I didn't really, you know, I, I never studied German. I'd never uh, been much to Germany otherwise. Yeah, my, I remember my dad asking, like, are you sure that you want to, like, live and work there? It's quite a different culture and everything. And I just sort of brushed it off. And uh, I learned, you know, firsthand that it's quite different from what I expected and very different from Japan. The biggest way that I saw that, and, and of course, there's an element that it's in Berlin as well, because there's a certain attitude that comes with you know, people in Berlin and this, uh, it's, you know, this, this type of thing, I guess, you know, if you uh, end up going to Germany, but in Japan, everyone was so nice in terms of, I mean, there's that Japanese politeness that people talk about and people trying to help and walking. Oh, if you don't know where you're going, they'll like point you in the right direction or walk down the street with you or whatever it is. So you go from that uh, where really customer is absolutely number one to Germany and particularly into Berlin. And it's like, Customer is definitely not number one. Um, you know, waiting twenty minutes, thirty minutes to be to have somebody come over and angrily take your order or like to be yelled at. Um, you know, it's it was it was a crazy uh, change for me, and so I, I really had to develop a lot thicker skin, to be honest, to to make it work in Germany. And after you know a while, after at least a year, eventually uh, managed to make it work, but. I think that was a big change in terms of the daily life and and really adjusting to that. I think in terms of work, I was luckily uh, working with quite an international and global team there in Japan, still for a Japanese company. So I still the, the hierarchy and going back to the headquarters um, where you know many less people, much less people spoke English and things like that. I mean, it was a challenge. Of course, uh, got a chance to use my Japanese as well, but. Um, you know, with, with working in an international startup in Germany, uh, in Berlin, everyone pretty much was speaking English, um, at least in business communications. Of course, you'd hear German or other languages along the way. But I think it was a generally more international experience that felt more like working at a tech company in San Francisco. So I wouldn't say that that was, I mean, that was different between Japan and Germany, but it was similar to my experiences in the United States. But it was really the day-to-day, -day, you know, go how to go through life and do get things done and interact with people and learn all the different rules and regulations and you know what to do what to do what not to do um that that probably uh, was the toughest to adjust to in the first year i can believe it i can believe it and i'm sure that you had a similar transition again to portugal except the difference was uh you were now married uh, to a japanese woman so now you're in a in a multinational relationship uh and moved to a different country entirely a new country for both of you so how was that process of the two of you moving to a completely foreign country for both of you i i it feels complicated to me but maybe maybe it's not what was it like so we met there in Germany and my my now wife uh, had already spent quite some time in Germany. So for her, I think she viewed, in a sense, she viewed Germany in the way that I viewed Japan uh, in terms of our, you know, interest and, and interest in the culture and living there. And so um, it was really interesting to meet and to date and ultimately get married while we were both, um, you know, in, in a third country, let's say, uh, to both of our backgrounds. But also, um, I think it was not too far into the relationship when we started talking about where it was next. I think she was kind of getting a little tired of Germany after a couple more years there than me. And 
I kind of knew that it wasn't the last place for me. I, I, I guess I would have thought more so being Japan. Uh, whereas when I went, uh, that didn't happen, of course, as we talked about. But then going into Germany, my and especially Berlin, my th- my thinking was, I want to work in a you know English speaking company, do the type of work that I want to do, and be in Central Europe in a cool city, get to travel on the weekends and all of that good stuff. So that was my mentality going in, not like. Hey, I'm moving to Germany. Let's, you know, deep dive in German culture and the German language. And this is, you know, the next 20 years of my life. So I think we both kind of had that mentality going into um, the relationship as well. So we had, a, I remember still, at least in my memory, <laughs> maybe my wife would say, you know, it happened a different way. But my, my memory of it is we had this conversation quite early on where it was like, what, what might be next for us? What might be interesting? And my thought was, uh, I had basically visited Vietnam for about a week and a half, and I thought it was just awesome. I was like, how about Vietnam? <laughs> I was like, let's get back to, to Asia. And she's like, uh, you know, I don't know about that. That sounds a little too far out there. Um, you know, how about Portugal? And then I remember back to my trip around Europe and the great time I had in Lisbon and Porto at the end of my trip. And I was like, yeah, that, that's actually a good idea. So about um, a year or so later, we took a trip for, uh, for a week to a couple of days each in each city and we came back just absolutely uh, sold on it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened in between, but about a year after that trip was when we moved uh, to Porto. So uh, it's basically for us, I think it's great that we're in the third country yet uh, again, that we had never lived in before because it's not going back to, to my home country of the United States, which is not really what I want to do. It's not going back to Japan, which is not something that she really wants to do. And if we end up back in one of those countries in the future, you know, for good reason, so be it. Um, that would be cool. And, you know, I'm always open to Japan if I'm, if I'm figuring out my work situation. But I think for us, just being in sort of a neutral third country, which is exciting and interesting and fun for both of us is a great way to do it. Um, but I think you have to be with the right person and with the right mindset to to have that adventurous personality. But I guess that's the point of also finding somebody outside of their home country abroad as well. Um, you kind of go in knowing uh, that they might have that mentality and you try traveling together and just seeing, you know, having those conversations and seeing how it works. And Portugal is a very popular country for people to emigrate to uh, on a variety of levels. I think they make getting residency relatively easy for uh, retirees. They're developing digital nomad style products. When you two moved to Portugal, did you do so? Did you have expat empire running yet or did you both get working visas and jobs on the ground first? I had started in 2018, so I was doing it as a side project since, uh, you know, living in Berlin. And so actually... um, it wasn't my plan to do that fully initially in, in Portugal, but I guess my the dream in the back of my mind, even at the beginning of all of this, was to be working on it while I was living in Portugal. But it wasn't necessarily to use it to get to Portugal. If it happened that way, so be it. But I think um, I wasn't quite ready at that time to go all in on it. So for me, it was thinking about, okay, how could, I, how could we get there? Um, how could we make this happen? And so at first I thought, uh, maybe I'd be able to work remotely for that Berlin-based company that I was working for last uh, while I was living there. And then this is the more the detailed part, but got laid off yet again. Uh, so it was like suddenly like, the disruption that we talked about before, that was a huge disruption of that plan. Um, but then it was really, uh, it was actually a process of applying to jobs all over Europe. I mean, I would like to say that I just focused purely on Portugal. It was our goal. It was our dream. But I didn't know if I would find the right job here. And after a couple months of searching in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Tallinn, Barcelona, Madrid, um, Porto and Lisbon, and a couple of other countries along the way, it was uh, just got like the perfect offer for me in terms of what I wanted to do. And it was in Porto, which is the city that we, we kind of preferred over Lisbon. They're both great, but that's, that's what we wanted. Um, it was, you know, that was pretty awesome. So basically... Uh, after many months of searching, got the good news, uh, immediately after the call, like we just hugged, burst into tears. Like this is the, this is the dream come true. So, um, headed over for that. And basically I started with working visa and, uh, and then as I got laid off yet again, uh, in November, 2020, it was like, okay, um, now's the chance to finally take a bit of my, um, fate into my own hands and start working for myself, which is 
ultimately the goal that I had, I wasn't sure when it would you know, happen. But like I said, uh, working on this in Portugal was the goal. So it was a great opportunity to do so. Well, and certainly Expat Empire is a very logical business for you to have started because you have you have the experience of living and working abroad in a variety of different countries. So you are well suited to helping other people uh, satisfy their dreams of relocating and living abroad. So what are the kinds of people who come to you for help uh, and how do you serve them? Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely trying to help people moving from anywhere to anywhere from all different types of backgrounds. So, um, of course, we see a lot of different stuff, but I'd say in terms of the average profile, it's an American trying to move to Europe or, of course, become a digital nomad you know, somewhere uh, somewhere around the world. So we do, uh, I guess I'd say, help people more in terms of the typical backgrounds as well are retirees or digital nomads or people who want to become local employees uh, for, for companies uh, in those countries. And so, um, yeah, I'd say that's kind of what we're generally seeing, but uh, we'd like to talk to people from all different walks of life and backgrounds and see how we can help. So it's uh, it's been a really fun journey to try to be able to help people in the same way that I was looking for help in terms of trying to find my way to Japan um, when I decided that's where I wanted to be when I was, you know, started when I was 12, but then really was sure when I was 17. And it was so hard to find a good mentor, or a good person to talk to, to be able to figure out how to make it happen. So, you know, uh, that's what I channeled first into the book, Passports Working in Japan, which was the first kind of thing that I put out into the world for Expert Empire along with the website. But after that, it was just trying to figure out how we could help people more in terms of our content and our services. So you are geared towards helping people to relocate by uh, providing them with specifically with what what kind of information? Like, do you help them find jobs, or do you just give them things to be aware of? How how far down the rabbit hole do you go with people who are looking to relocate? Yeah, that's a good way to put it because it's definitely quite a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> so we really help with the planning aspects of it. But I, what I would say is we also work with our partners, the relocation companies, the immigration lawyers, the tax accountants, the you know all of that good stuff, basically to help people on the ground. So really our goal is to be able to help people from literally day one, step one, they're just thinking about becoming a digital nomad. They're thinking about retiring abroad or finding a local job for the very first time. You know, uh, if they reach out to us, we're happy to have that conversation all the way until the point where they're fully settled into their destination or at least living the life that they want to be living, uh, you know, abroad and living abroad. So um, we help in terms of the planning process and doing that all digitally and remotely through services like coaching, of course, so I can work with people one on one. But outside of that, we have services like destination comparison. So if people want to think about moving to a couple of different countries or a couple of different cities, we can help them compare them in a more data driven approach in a single spreadsheet so they can really compare across countries on the same types of metrics as opposed to just like I saw a cool post about this country or I always wanted to go to, you know, X uh, place and, and really do it in a more um, objective kind of data driven approach. And then we also have services like timeline planning so that people can see all the steps they have to take and when they have to take them to leave their home country and move in and settle in the first year in their new country. Uh, we have the job search services as well. So we don't necessarily help people find jobs or do any placement or things like that, but we help them strategize around how they can find jobs in other countries or um, you know, working on their applications and the resume, cover letter, um, LinkedIn profile, mock interviews and things like that. In the remote uh, side of things, we have the remote work roadmap. So helping people think through what skills that they have or that they could develop into finding ways to make income online and be able to be more of a remote worker or um, you know, start their own business and become a digital nomad. Um, so those are a couple of services that we offer. But then again, all of our partners, we have you know, based in countries around the world to help with the actual immigration process, finding homes, uh, moving pets, moving things, uh, kind of you name it. We try to cover it in terms of our partnerships as well. Okay, so I'm dying to know. What is, if anything, the most common misconception that the people who come to you have about what it's going to be like to live and work abroad? I would say a lot of people come without, you know, much uh, research done or they've read a couple of blog posts or something, which is, of course, a great place to start. You don't have to do much, you know, any research to reach out and have a conversation. But I think 
um, you know, people are sort of trying to figure it out on their own. And, uh, and I totally understand that desire. And there's so much content out there now. But I think being able to really work with somebody who's done it before, talk to someone who has or, a, you know, immigration lawyer, like we talked about before, I think goes so much further and makes the process so much smoother than trying to piece all this together from short, you know, blog posts or uh, videos and things like that online. Um, so I think that's probably one of the things that sticks out to me. But what I've also seen just personally from the people who have moved abroad and are doing it for the first time is just not realizing how really long it takes to get settled into a new place or into a new type of lifestyle. It's just, it, it is exciting. It is dynamic. It is fun, but it also can be super lonely. It can be very difficult. The visa processes or adapting to culture, um, you know, dealing with bad landlords, like all of this stuff, not that it's exclusive to living abroad or, uh, you know, living in another country, they're bad landlords all over the world, but it's just one of those things that um, I always tell people to expect it to take a year until they're really comfortable and settled in a new place. And I have to remind myself of that even after all of these moves, because it's always like, I want it to be, you know, I've done this so many times now, shouldn't it go faster? But actually the reality is it doesn't go any faster because all of those, you know, paperwork and processes and getting settled and more importantly, to make great friends. I mean, it's one thing to grab a beer with somebody or meet someone at a hostel or to, you know, go to an event and meet somebody, but to make a real friend that you really connect with, that you can share with, and, you know, including those personal details and not just have somebody that has a good night out, out in the town, that's really difficult to do. And you can't fast track that. And so I think just having that long-term mentality, recognizing it's going to take a lot of time is really important up front because otherwise you might, you know, it's fine if you decide to move to another country or uh, go back to your home country, but you might be doing it a bit premature if you're expecting it to happen in a month or two months instead of a year or two years. All right, people, you heard it here first. Patience, patience, patience. Uh, and also, too, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Hire people to help you through this process because it will be a longer and more frustrating process than you might expect. Uh, find some local friends along the way. I think this is all very fabulous advice. And also, you mentioned some of the challenges, you know, bad landlords and, and, and things that can be a problem anywhere in the world. In my experience, when I am uh, living or traveling abroad and I experience the stuff of life, that stuff, when experienced abroad, and outside of our general comfort zones is in technicolor. So uh, definitely expect the normal stuff to be crazy and overwhelming, at least in the beginning. David, I'm really appreciated of your uh, of your time spent with me. Where and how can people find you? Yeah, thank you again so much for having me. Uh, it'd be great if people could check us out on expatempire.com. We have a bunch of the content there. You can learn about our services as well. And of course, we offer a, a free consulting call initially to get to know people, hear their goals and dreams, and give some advice and feedback and see how we might be able to help them to achieve it. So you can check us out at expatempire.com. And we're on all the social media at, those, uh, at Expat Empire as well. Awesome. And those links will be in the show notes or description uh, for people to check David out and come into his world and learn more about what it's like to be an expat and to do it right the first time around. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm Nora Dunn, otherwise known as the professional hobo, and I look forward to catching you next time. Sure.